Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4. There's six chapters in 1 Timothy. We are on chapter 4. The Spirit, you know, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Wow. That's a harsh statement. Listen to what I'm about to say. There is a harsh statement that is describes today's society perfectly. <laughs> it's harsh. It's a harsh truth. It's a prophecy because whenever you talk about something in the future, it's a prophecy. But it's true. What he's saying is true. It came true. Now listen to what it says here. The Spirit, the Spirit of God, clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith. Now, Paul is not talking about the people back then. He's saying in the latter times, meaning the last times, the latter times, the times at the end. In the latter times, when things are winding down, see, and that describes 2023, Anyone who has studied the Bible, you know, pretty well, I mean, for quite a while, even five years, understands that we are in the last days. We are in the last few years before the rapture and then the 1,000-year reign. Well, the tribulation, then the 1,000-year reign. So, now listen to how he describes today. And you will see life in 2023 around you. Some will abandon the faith. Now listen to what people are following today. Now, he's talking about believers here. Now listen very carefully now. The Spirit clearly says in latter times, some will abandon the faith. Okay. You have to be following the faith before you can abandon the faith. You have to own a house before the house can be burned down. You have to have $1,000 in your pocket before you go give it all away to a casino. You know, so he's saying you have to have faith first. That's why I'm saying he's talking about believers in the latter days. And boy, I'm seeing this. But I'll, I'll give some good news here. I'm seeing believe, some believers are waking up and they're becoming really super strong believers. Like they were kind of wishy-washy two years ago. And now they're like 10 times stronger than they were ever in their entire life. I'm seeing that right now. So it's not all bad news. God reserves some for himself. Now look at some people in the last days are going to fall away from the faith. It says abandon the faith. Now it's going to tell why they abandon the faith and what they replace the faith with. And follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Oh, yeah. Follow deceiving spirits and follow things taught by demons. Well, name one thing that you could say a demon is teaching people in America to do. Pornography. I talk about it a lot. Homosexuality. Same-sex marriage. Sex changes. Um, call, telling people they're racist, but you're not a racist. Saying 100% of white people are racist because you were born white. 
All these things are not from God. None of these things are from God. In fact, the people who teach these things don't even... Um, they don't claim God. No, they claim themselves. But what is Paul saying here that what's happening? If you want to know what's happening around you right now... Now, if you're following God, it doesn't have to happen to you. And why do we read the Bible at least five, six days a week? So you don't abandon your faith in, in Jesus Christ. You say, well, I could never abandon my faith. Oh, sure you could. You could abandon your faith if you stop practicing your faith. It's that simple. Think of Christianity like going to the Olympics. Let's say you're you're the world's fastest runner. If that guy doesn't train six days a week or that woman doesn't train six days a week, within one year, they're not the world's fastest runner. They're very slow. They won't even take like um, sixth place. Think of your Christianity that way. If you're not practicing daily your Christianity, then you've somewhat by default, by description, you have abandoned your Christianity. You know, that's why most marriages dissolve. One of the spouses in the marriage has abandoned the marriage. And I don't mean physically leaving the house. I'm talking about one spouse is like, Well, I just want, I'm not being fulfilled. I want something else. I don't think my husband or my wife's that attractive. We're all fat. We're all stupid. I don't know. There's got to be something else. And they start to panic and they say, I'm, I'm already 55 years old. I don't want to, I'm only going to be alive for 20 more years. They start to panic and they say, I'm going to go out and get what I want. And then the marriage dissolves. Okay, so all I can say is your Christianity is the same way. If you abandon it, you will lose it if you stop practicing it. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars. You see, you don't ever see a demon. If you are seeing demons, um, you got a lot of problems. You don't ever see demons. They don't, they don't appear. They work the same way their father, the devil, works. Through people. They want to destroy God's children, God's kingdom, through his followers. So the demons teach through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Wow. Their conscience has been seared. Now, you could take that one way or another. You could say, like, I would think if my conscience was seared with a hot iron, I would never lie again. But that's not what they're saying. They're saying the complete opposite. Their conscience has been seared with a hot iron so that lying doesn't even bother them anymore. They just are, they become professional liars. I know some professional liars and you know some professional liars. Everybody knows people who lie continually. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. Wow. Jesus, I mean, God the Father clearly said, a man and a woman shall become one and become husband and wife. One man, one woman. And here it says they're forbidding people to marry and then they say you must abstain from certain foods. You know, that's what the Mormons do. They say you're not allowed to eat certain foods. Jesus made all foods clean so we wouldn't have this problem. And the Mormons come by 1,900 years later and claim that they have a whole new gospel of Jesus Christ and you're supposed to marry only other Mormons and you're supposed to um, sustain from certain foods. 
Doesn't that sound like um, what Paul is describing here right down to the letter? Which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know and who know the truth. Yes, I just told you the truth. Jesus made all foods clean. And it just said we are to receive them with thanksgiving. Yes. But what do the Mormons say? Oh, no, you can't even go to heaven if you eat those foods. Huh? That doesn't make sense. That That is contrary to the Bible. But guess what? That's what the, the book of the Mormons teach. God created these foods to be received by us with thanksgiving because we know the truth. We are taught by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the believers. Non-believers are taught by demons. For everything God created is good and nothing to be and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Now he's now listen to what it says. Everything God created is good. Does that mean alcohol? No, I don't believe God created alcohol. What about marijuana? God did not create today's marijuana. God created up until about um, 80 years ago, they used to find this marijuana, the Native American Indians growing on the side of the road, and they would smoke it as a... Um, a very mild um, pain killer. It was like smoking a couple aspirin. It's a true story. Today's marijuana has different names. They have a thousand different names. It comes from different places. They put certain things into the marijuana. They take the plants and, and slice them together so you can have... like different strands of marijuana, making marijuana really super strong. Marijuana is man-made today. It's not the um, the plant that God created. That There's a lot of plants God created that we can use for medicine. But God did not create the plants they have today coming out of the marijuana labs that get people high as a kite and and go into psychedelic, um, you know, fantasies. And if God created it, it is good. And it should not be rejected. It should be received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters... You will be a good minister of Jesus, of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. I was just going to say, you'll be a good minister because you're telling the truth. Now, there's, there's two different ways to tell someone the truth. The dumb way and the wise way. If someone doesn't want to hear the truth, don't tell them. Well, you say, I am commanded by I am commanded by Jesus Christ to tell the truth, regardless of what people think or not. And I'm not saying you have to become a salesman of the gospel, but what about you are commanded to to love all people and you're commanded to have mercy in all people and kindness. And then the truth should come out of your mouth. The truth should not come out of your mouth if you're, you know, screaming it at someone. I've been to a church before. It was a long time ago. Way back in Iowa. This guy was literally... He, he almost had people pee in their pants, right? In the spot. He had those people shaken that if you just commit one small sin, you're going to hell. Oh, he was screaming the word. 
The guy was a false prophet being taught by demons. I'm telling you. If it's from God, it's good, and you are to receive it with thanksgiving. And, but the way you point it out to people, you should go up to Jesus and offer them an invitation. Do you know about Jesus Christ? Start from there. I always, If someone starts, I always let them bring it up. And then I say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I give like this miniature testimony. I say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I've been a Christian for over 50 years. So, and, but they brought it up. And I say, so do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I don't say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Everybody believes in Jesus. Jesus was a historical figure that you can find documents about. We're not asking you to believe if Jesus lived. Even the demons believe that Jesus lived 2,000 some years ago. We're asking, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? There's a whole difference. And then I see what the answer, they go, no. I say, would you like to talk about it because you brought it up? And, and you know, 80% say, no, I don't want to talk about that. I say, okay. And I just let it go because they brought it up. But it's at 20%, sometimes 30%, they say, yeah, I would like to talk about it. Say, well, is there something, ask them a question. Is there something on your mind that, you know, because every one of those non-believers, they have one area, and just to save time and not get in a big argument with them, they have one area, one single area that they have convinced themselves in their mind why they do not want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And you have to let them go through that area and blurt it out, and then you can start working the truth. You can start working the truth with them on the area that they spoke about, you see. But you want to approach people gently. You'll be a good minister of Jesus, of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. So how is God teaching you? Let's say you're 40 years old. How is God teaching you in the last 40 years? Is he hitting you with a rod and whipping you? No. I don't know anybody that's being whipped by Jesus. Jesus is teaching you gently and slowly. He's doing a good work in you with love. So you, likewise have to teach like Jesus taught you. See, there's a big difference how you teach. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. I haven't heard that one in quite a while. Old wives' tales. So in a previous chapter, we talked about women gossiping. And here we got it again. What is the definition of an old wives tale? If you're not understanding what I'm saying, I'm not saying wise tale, W I S E no. I'm saying old wives, W I V E S. How come they don't say old husband tale? Cuz I'm telling you in a previous chapter men do not sit around gossiping. One of the main spiritual Christian problems women have is gossiping. That's why they say old wives tell. What is wives tell? It's it's a bunch of women gossiping and coming up with stories about someone. Rather, train yourself to be godly. So listen to what it says. Instead of doing that, blabbing your mouth all day long, train yourself to be godly. 
Do you notice it did not say be godly? Like you can just push a big red button and you are instantly like God, godly. No, give yourself a break. You're supposed to train yourself to be godly. See, I myself, I've been a believer for 50 years and I consider myself, I'm, in, I'm still in training to be more like Jesus. <laughs> that may shock you. So if you've only been a Christian for two or three years, or even five days or something, don't get discouraged because that's what the enemy wants you to become discouraged and give up and then abandon your faith. No, no, no. You're in training. Think of your um, Christianity like a muscle. You want big mu biceps? You got to go to the gym for five years to get the real massive biceps. Yeah. Look at my big muscles. But like Paul says in the Bible, um, exercise has some use, but your spiritualness is like a thousand times more useful than any exercise could ever be to you. So it did not say be more godly. It says... For, physic, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. It says, train yourself to be more godly. And you should be training every day is what I'm saying. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. This is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope, we have put our hope in the living God. That's right. I remember in the 70s, they used to have stickers, God is dead. And then bumper stickers. Then people came out with bumper stickers, God is not dead. <laughs> but it's true. God is alive in the living God. They're telling you something. So you say, boy, I want to know more about who God is. What is he? Where did he come from? Well, you got to read the Bible, and it tells you little by little. Here, it just told you something about God. God is living. He's alive. You just learned something more about God. Who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. God wants to save everyone, but they're not all going to be saved. Only the believers are going to be saved. Now, this chapter is almost over, actually. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. He's talking specifically to Timothy. But you can use this if you are a young Christian. Don't let people look down on you if you're telling the truth. Or if they do look down on you, don't let it bother you. Just kind of let it go by. Don't let anyone, you know, brush it off. Who cares? Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That means no pornography. You cannot look at pornography and claim that you are living in God's purity. So you say, well, how do I become more like Jesus? Well, let's back up. You can control your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, and your purity to become more like Jesus. I just told you how to be, four ways to become more like Jesus. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture. That's what I'm doing right here. I'm publicly reading the Scripture on this channel and teaching it. And whoever wants to look at it can. To preaching and to teaching. Paul is saying, until I return to you, Timothy, keep preaching and teaching and living in love and purity. 
You, so Timothy had to train to be more godly every day. You are going to have to train to be more godly every day. Do not neglect your gift. Well, you could say we all have a gift. You might not know what yours is, but I'll give you one gift right away. You have the gift of salvation. You may not have figured out what your other gifts are yet. God may not have revealed them to you yet. I cannot tell you what they are because I am not your father. I'm just a guy on, you know, the video. I can't personally tell you what your gifts are. I know what most of my gifts are, I, but, you know, I can't tell you what yours are. But we all have the same gift of salvation. And they're saying, do not neglect it. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So at some point, Timothy, you know, they're going to put him in charge of certain things. And a bunch of elders laid their hands on him. And all the elders agreed this is the gift God's going to give him. And they spoke about it, and they all had the same answer. And then Timothy received that gift. Be diligent in these matters. Let's look at the word of diligent. The, 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 you know, the word diligent. Putting um, your, your Christianity aside for a minute. You can easily name three things that you're very diligent on in your life. Like three things you never let go. You're always pushing them forward. You're always doing them. For some, it's football, basketball, baseball. For some, it's um, cycling. For some, it's exercising. For some, it's their family. For some, are in love with making money. It's all about making money. But what are they saying? Be diligent in these matters. In your Christian spiritual matters, be diligent. Give yourself wholly to them. So holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, could also be used as the word fully, F-U-L-L-Y. Give yourself wholly, fully onto the things of God. You know, we talked about in many of the chapters before, who are you living for to please? Are you living to please God? Or are you living to please man, the men around you? So that everyone may see your progress. You see, non-believers, non-believers should see positive changes in your life as a Christian. Non-believers should see fruit growing in you as a Christian. They know you're a Christian, but they want to see the results, man. They're like, well, yeah, he's a Christian, but I don't, you know, that's why I said in a pre previous chapter, if you are sitting around getting drunk, smoking dope, taking drugs, you're living with a girl. You're not married. She's been with three other guys. She has five children by two different men. And now you're going to go outside and start trying to preach Jesus Christ. So imagine if you owned a yard care business, a lawn care business. And you're trying to you're out there trying to get customers, right? I mean, don't you think the guy who does lawn care should have the best lawn in the neighborhood? Just makes common sense. So you're out there trying to get customers like you, well, I'd like to be your customer. Let me drive by your house and see what your lawn looks like first, buddy. And if your lawn looks great, then I'll I'll hire you to make my lawn look like your lawn. So they drive by your house and your lawn looks like 15 tornadoes just touched down in the backyard. You got weeds growing everywhere upside the house. Your house is moldy. It's never been pressure washed. You, you know, your sidewalks are covered with weeds. 
You think that person's going to hire you to do their lawn? So that everyone may see your progress. So that everyone may see your progress. You, you as a believer, you have a billboard on your forehead. Hi, my name's um, Billy or Susie. I'm a Christian. And then every move you make tells them what kind of a Christian you are. So they can see your progress. Are you giving them progress? Are you showing progress, Christian fruits? Christian fruits in your life. Are you going to ask Pee Wee Herman to um, be your, your physical trainer at the gym? You know, the guy's got real skinny arms, no muscles, never worked out a day in his life. Are you going to ask Pee Wee Herman? Now, I got nothing against Pee Wee Herman. He just passed away, actually. But you wouldn't hire Pee Wee Herman to tell you how to get big muscles at the gym. No, you'd hire Pee Wee Herman to make you laugh or something. No, you'd hire, like, The Rock. You'd want him to be your personal trainer. The same, I'm just trying to emphasize the same things with your Christianity. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly, fully to them so that everyone may see your progress. That just described Christianity down to a T. That described Christianity perfectly. That described Christianity the best I've ever heard. After you become a Christian, how to live, be diligent in your Christianity. Give yourself fully to your Christianity so that everyone may see the progress in your Christianity. You cannot describe your relationship with God any better than that. And if it, your, your relationship is lacking with Jesus, well, now you know why. You're not giving yourself fully to your Christianity. You, you give, you know, part, God is just a part-time job to you. You have your full-time job in the world, but it's not working out. <laughs> it's not enough money, so you have to go get a part-time job to make more money. So you go get a part-time job with God, go get some advice. Well, you need to flip that. You need to get your full-time job with God. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Oh, yeah. Watch your life and your doctrine. What you doctrine, D-O-C-T-R-I-N-E. What you believe. Your doctrine is what's coming out of your heart. This is what I truly believe. That's why I'm preaching it. So when the Mormons say, you're not allowed to eat certain foods or you're going to go to hell, they don't even believe that because the Bible teaches the complete opposite. They don't believe it because they only are being told by the people in charge of the Book of Mormon what to believe. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Preserve, persevere in them. Here it goes again, fully, holy. Persevere in these things because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Yes, Timothy. He had a gift of, you know, probably talking people into believing and becoming saved. That's the end of chapter 5. That's the end of chapter 4, sorry. There, I just proved I'm not perfect. I can't even keep the chapter straight. <laughs> I want to read that. I'll just read it, and then I'll let you go. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do you will save both yourself and your hearers the people listening <laughs>